long. I'd like you to take the Word of God and open it, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We are entering into part two of the message, The Church is God's Building. This is The Church is God's Building, part two. And Paul's helping the church see herself and her leaders through the, a biblical lens, a biblical worldview. Paul's giving them a set of biblical spectacles through which to see themselves as a church and to see the, the leaders and the teachers in the church to help them see that they're ministers too and that all things have been freely given to them from the Lord in the church to enjoy. And so their bickering and fighting as a church is really, it's not only foolish, it's not only childish, it's not only counterproductive, but it's unnecessary because all these men have been given to them as gifts from God. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. In chapter 3, Paul begins by comparing them to spiritually immature babies who don't understand grown-up talk. He says that you have an appetite for milk and not for meat. And the idea is they don't have the teeth to dig into the Word of God. And they, they don't have the teeth to dig in and discover meaningful truth and then consume it with any real skill or appreciation. So because of that deficiency, because of their deficiency in, in being unable to really enjoy the Word for themselves, they not only can't receive it, but they haven't, Grad, grown up to the point where they're able to teach it. So as a body, they're unable to use their words to encourage each other. Instead, they're using their words to bite and devour and harm each other. And so this is a good, good illustration, the immaturity illustration. So the body of Christ is not growing properly. It's not growing up because the members aren't edifying each other in love. The word of God itself, and our ability to appreciate it is more important than our preferred orthodox teachers. What's more important than having Paul as a pastor or Apollos or even Peter as a pastor would be the church's ability to consume the word, appreciate it, and also give it to one another. That's how the church grows healthily. Um, if you could imagine going to a, a wonderful steakhouse and they bring you out a steak that's perfectly cooked and it's, it's uh, hot and piping and I, I don't want to wet your whistle too much for steak because we're getting ready for the Word of God. But imagine they bring you out a perfectly cooked piece of meat and your friend's with you and they bring you the same thing and he says, oh, I'm so frustrated that Mike served this meat to me. I, I wanted Jim to serve it because Mike brings it out in his right hand and Jim brings it out in his left hand. And now I would prefer that so much. You would say, buddy, I don't, <laughs> I don't really care. I'm not here to have it served by Mike or to have it served by Jim. I'm here for the steak. And the same thing should be true when it comes to the church and the word of God. We should be thankful and appreciative whenever it's properly served and we shouldn't care so much about style or the personality of the person who delivers it to us now, these petty differences kind of got under their skin and it was it was hurting the church and so paul makes the point that we're just ministers he says in verse 5 of chapter 3 who's paul who's apollos we're ministers by whom he believed so it isn't that the job of communicating the truth is unimportant it is critically important. It's very important. It's crucial to the life of the church. But God, who gives the increase to the church, is the same God who gives the gift of Bible teachers to the church. They come in and they plant. They come in and they water. Each one of us are responsible to hear and to receive it and then to speak and to give out the word of God properly. And when we faithfully obey, God gives the increase. And so verse 9 brings us to the point where Paul says, for we are laborers together with God. And he uses the farming analogy, and now he, he uses a building analogy. We are laboring with God, 
He's working and we work with him, whether that's in the church as a farm and the lessons we got there, or it's in the church as a building. And so these are the lessons he gives from that. And again, I'm gonna, I, I have to keep saying this. The church is not the building as far as the structure. The church is a building as far as God is building a place to dwell on the earth. The church, the assembly, the gathering of the saints, that is the church. That is the building. That is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 23 is our text. Let's read it together. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it's written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain." Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is the word of the Lord. Would you seek the Lord with me in prayer together? Father, we humbly ask for your blessing on the word as it's preached As it's heard, Lord, may each of us not only be hearers, but be doers. Help us to be good hearers, to receive, to appreciate what we hear from your book as the Word of God, to recognize by your Spirit where the teaching is true and accurate and right, and then, Lord, to obey it. Empower us to do that. Help us that we might not be deceived, that we might not be tricked, by those who are crafty and wise in their own way. But may we be humbly submitted to you, looking at the wisdom of the world as foolishness and looking at your truth and your work as wisdom. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I said last week, that chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians is Paul bringing to bear the teaching of chapter 2 on the problem of chapter 1. And most of us, I think, have been here from chapter 1 on, and we know what the problem was. The problem was unnecessary division in the church. People just not getting along, fighting and bickering over their preferred Bible teacher and and kind of making little divisions in the church and little cliques and those kinds of things. And the teaching in chapter 2 is that the, the work of Christ in the gospel and the work of the Spirit present in the church is enough for the church to gain the mind of Christ, to know what he's thinking, to know what he's doing, to know what he would have them to do so that they could grow up. And then in chapter 3, he makes conclusions off of that. Here's your problem, and here's what Christ has done for you that should cure that. If it hasn't, there has to be a problem. And so chapter 3 is really pointed at some of their specific issues, their immaturity, their failure to recognize that it's God who works in the church, those kinds of things. His message in verse 9 is, Ye, plural, are God's building, uh, singular. And then he has this same message later in our text, verse 17, um, 
which temple ye are. Temple, singular, ye, plural. So you all, he's saying to the people at Corinth, are God's building. You all together are God's building. You all together are God's people. And he gives then individual commands. And they all start with the word let. And he gives three of them, which kind of help for a guy who likes to have three points in a sermon. That helps me. But he gives three individual commands, which led us to say last week, these are commands for me in a passage about us. How many of you remember doing that? How many of you remember doing that? Good, because I want to have you do it again. Turn to someone near you, look at them. Turn to someone near you. Look at their face. Look in their eyes. Find someone. Look, at, look in their eyes. And I want you to say, this, or these are commands for me in a passage about us. Say that with me. These are commands for me in a passage about us. Good. Now look at someone else. Make eye contact with a different person. Go ahead. Make eye contact with someone and say, these are commands for me in a passage about us. And so this is a passage about the church. But Paul is saying this is how you should function in light of what God is telling us about the church. And the first of the three let commands covers verses 10 through 15. And we find it in verse 10. Let every man take heed how he builds. There's the structure, the church, God's building. God's building and we're laboring with him in his kingdom. And he says, give your very best to my work. Don't give your leftovers. Each one of us will be personally interviewed by God at the end of our lives to see whether we gave the best of our lives to his work in the world or if we gave him what was left over. And the trial is by fire. And that which is most valuable comes out as gold, silver, and precious stones. That which is least valuable comes out as wood, hay, and stubble. And so, you know, we all have gold, we all have silver, we all have precious stones. We have that which is best of our time, of our talents, and of our treasure. We all have that which is best, and we have that which is least the problem is when we give the best of our time, the best of our talents, the best of our treasures to that which is not God. And so there's nothing wrong with so many different things in its place. Our own family, we love to play sports. We love to go out fishing. You, you can go over here and find a, an arrow stuck in a tree from where we were shooting bow and arrow down the hill here uh, last week. We enjoy lots of different things. But the point is, don't give your best to all of those things. Jesus put it this way, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There's nothing wrong with so many of these things in their place, but they tend to want to take over. And so Paul reminds us, give of your best to God. Give of your best to the Lord. Don't be stingy. Don't be greedy. And recognize this is a graded scale. Paul's going to teach us later in this same book, we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. And God does not call us all to do the same things. God calls us all to be faithful to him and invest our best in his work by working in his husbandry, in his farm, or in his building, the church. But don't get from this that God is hard or steel-nosed in his judging. You remember the parable Jesus tells in Matthew 25, verse 24, where the servant says, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, strawing where thou hast not, or reaping where thou hast not stone, str sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And that man didn't actually know the Lord. He went and buried his treasure. He buried his talent. He consumed it on something that was worthless instead of investing it where God was working, he put it elsewhere. And it turns out he didn't know the Lord. But Jesus said this. Listen to the words of Jesus. And write this reference down because every one of us should reference this. 
especially if you grow weary in the work of the Lord or if you tend to doubt the goodness and love of God, write this down, Luke 12, 32. Luke 12, 32. Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Don't think for a second that God isn't anxious to reward you that gold, silver, and precious stones for your good investment. It's His good pleasure. He saved us when we were against Him. Of course He loves us. Of course He wants to reward us. But then the opposite is true, that if we as Christians aren't faithful to Him, if we misjudge our Lord or if we refuse to serve Him out of fear, we will suffer a loss of reward. And those are the two judgment scenarios for believers. Either reward or a loss of reward. And I like the way that that's worded because I think it shows God's heart is that he anticipates to give a reward. He wants to give a reward. He has a reward planned. He has a reward prepared and there can be a loss. And I think that's interesting. But Paul then, he doesn't assume that every person who has joined themselves to the church is a believer. So his second command, and this is where we left off last week, is let no man deceive himself. So the first point is, let every man take heed how he builds. That's verses 10 through 15. Second point, let no man deceive himself. Verses 16 through 20. And Paul lists the third man in verse 17. Some invest leftovers and that which is of little value into the church of Christ. They suffer a loss of rewards. Some invest their best and give generously into God's building, which is the members of the church. Ye are the temple. Those people gain a reward. But the third person is not a builder at all. And what we found through experience and even through the life of Christ as he dealt with uh, the religious system in Israel, is that often these third people look like builders. They might look like someone who's building with gold, silver, and precious stones. They might look like someone who's building with wood, hay, and stubble. But in reality, they're not builders. They're destroyers. Verse 16 uses the plural, ye are the temple of God, And it's the same way, it's in verse 9, ye are God's building. But this is where we see what God's doing, what kind of building he's making. You aren't God's warehouse. You aren't God's shopping plaza. You're his temple. A temple is a sacred place. It's a holy place. It's a place that God sets aside and says, this is where I will dwell the uh, church wherever it assembles maybe in a building like ours maybe in a cathedral maybe in a stadium maybe out in a field somewhere the church wherever it gathers is a temple the temple of god the uh temple is the place where god puts his name where God puts his presence, where God says, my people will go, they'll gather and they'll preach, they'll pray, they'll sing, they'll study, they'll give, they'll fellowship, they'll worship, they'll edify one another in love. The church, the people, the assembly is not just a building, not just any building, it's a temple. And the temple ought to be a holy place. Throughout history, People have always built temples for their gods. God himself directed Israel to build a temple and uh, he was, uh, used David to collect the material. He used Solomon to build it. And if you remember the story, after the temple was dedicated, the presence of God came down and filled the temple. What an amazing thing that would have been to see. I think we could see it again today 
in his temple, in his church. I think we could have a similar thing where the Spirit of God comes and fills his church and sets his church apart, his temple. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. He says, I want to be in the temple. And he says, here's the two reasons. One, so that I can behold his beauty and so that I can inquire of the Lord, so that I can see him and so that I can commune with him. That's why David wanted to be in the temple. And friends, that's why the church is an important place. It's why the gathering is an important thing. It's where God meets with his people. You say, God can meet with me when I'm on my own. He can. He certainly can. But he will meet with us here when we assemble in his name. He will meet with us. We can behold his beauty. We can inquire of him. The temple is where God dwells. God dwells by his spirit in his church. Children, do you know where God lives? In heaven? Where else? In the hearts of his people. Where else? Let me give you three places. God dwells in, let's say it again. In his church, yes. God dwells in the heavens. God dwells in the hearts of his people. And God dwells in his church. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Look at verse 17. The word for defile is phthero. You say, why would I care? Well, it's interesting because also in verse 17, the word for destroy, the word translated destroy, is exactly the same. It's phthero. So we have this idea that what you do to the temple, God says, I'll do to you. If you defile the temple, God will defile you. You destroy the temple, God will destroy you. And the idea is whatever you do to God's church, he'll do to you. She is his temple. She's called to holiness. And what you do to God's temple, God will do to you. The church is Christ's bride, and she's called to purity. And what you do to Christ's bride, Christ will do to you. And this is really what the whole passage is saying. Those who are generous with God's building will find God is generous with them. Those who are tight-fisted and stingy with God's building will find that God is tight-fisted and stingy with them. Those who defile God's temple. God will destroy them. It's really a straightforward point here. But how would you young people feel if someone were to defile your mother? We know what that word means, don't we? Someone were to defile her. How would you husbands feel if someone defiled your wife? How would you parents feel if someone defiled your daughter? This is the intensity that God's speaking here. If any man defiles my temple, he says, he'll destroy them. He takes it personally. So, as a member of Christ's church, this should bring us a whole lot of joy. Christ takes offenses towards us very personally. Takes it very personally. Uh, a member of ours was out holding a sign after Roe v. Wade was overturned, thanking the Supreme Court. It said, thank you, SCOTUS, on the sign. And the man saw it and took a picture, and he put some pretty nasty things about our church online. Um, I wear that as a badge of honor. I wear that as a badge of honor honor 
Let the heathen rage. Let them be offended. They've been an offense to God their entire life. Let them be offended for a little while. That's fine with me. But you know, Christ takes attacks against his church personally. We have been guaranteed the special protection of God. Even in death, God's people go to be with him. Even in death, God's people go to heaven. There are those in the church of Corinth, back to our text, who appeared to be wise. They lorded their position over the church. They, they were masters there. They were wise there. They appeared to be strong and powerful there. They bullied other people. When the house of Chloe said, there's problems here, they were pushed to the side and ignored. Or Chloe and her family were. And the reality is, is that they weren't just deceived. They were deceiving themselves. They were saying, this is how things have to be. This is the way things have to go. This is how things have to work. But the church works differently than the world, and these people should have humbled themselves. They should have recognized that the worldly wisdom that they were using was going to be their undoing. I remember Pastor Fleming used to use Wiley Coyote as an example of Proverbs 26, verse 27, that says, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone it shall return upon him. And that's the meaning of 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19. That those folks who do not have the best of Christ's church in mind, rather they have their own best, they have their own good, they have their own uh, desires, they've not been delivered from their sin, they rather see the church as a place where they can enjoy their sin and still have the appearance of holiness and power and function in the church in that way. And Paul says in verse 19, he... That is, God taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The word craftiness here is interesting. Just know this, it's never used good, as a good thing in the Bible. When you see the word craftiness in the Scripture, it's never seen as a good thing. Oh, that's a really, really clever guy. You know, uh, That's maybe where we want to be a little, a little nervous. This kind of wisdom he's referring to is not the wisdom of God. It's the wisdom of the world, the cunning craftiness of men. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 11, if you would. The word behind craftiness in verse 19 is used five times in the Greek New Testament. Four out of five times it's translated as craftiness or cunning craftiness. But in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the same word is used. And the translators of our Bible rendered it as subtlety, which is a fine translation and helps us to see another sense to this word. But 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So notice this letter, it's a different letter, but it's the same people, and he uses this same word in this way. In verse 19, of 1 Corinthians 3, he says, the wise are taken in their own craftiness. And he uses that same word in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, how, for how the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. The worldly wisdom of 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19, is the same wisdom of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It's not the wisdom of God. It's some kind of cunning. It's some kind of subtlety. It's some kind of false appearance that says, yes, I'm on your side, while at the same time saying, has God really said? Did God really mean that when he spoke that way? These are wise guys, so to speak. But this subtlety doubts the truthfulness of God. This subtlety doubts whether God means what he says. 
this subtlety doubts the goodness and the mercies of Christ. This subtlety looks at the cross and still doubts whether they're loved by God. This subtlety doubts the judgments of God. In a word, this subtlety doubts God. And here's these folks who came in as lords. And look, they're clever. They could talk circles around the weaker folk. You ever meet someone who could talk circles around you? They don't give you a chance to think. You try to come up with your words and they they got their words and they you said and they don't try to understand. They don't love you. They just you're dealt with someone like that. And what are they doing? They're knocking them off from the simplicity of Christ. The subtlety of the serpent takes you away from the simplicity of Christ. But this worldly wisdom, Paul says, it's foolishness with God. He can see through it. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 20. He sees their thoughts. So imagine there's a smoke screen up that you can't see through, I can't see through it. Here's one of these worldly talkers, one of these crafty guys who comes into the church, wants to sow doubt, wants to sow sin, wants to bring in these things that make us divide up among ourselves and question the word of God. And here, God says, I can see right through that smoke screen. I can see right through that cloud they put up. It's vanity, it's empty, it's nothingness. This worldview of the world, and it must be abandoned if you are to be wise. The worldly wisdom of this text, generally speaking, is anything that contradicts the word of God. The wisdom of God is seen in the simplicity that is in Christ. The wisdom of God is seen in the gospel that created and builds God's church. The wisdom of God is seen in the lives of people who invest their time and their talents and their treasures into the flock of God, into the temple of God. The world calls calls us to invest our time, talents, and treasures into anything and everything but eternity. And God sees through that smoke screen and he calls us to something better. Don't give your life to that, he says. He, tells, he calls us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And he says, let no man deceive himself. The most important thing going on in the world today is whatever God is doing. The most important place to be in the world today is where God is. Don't be deceived. You can give your life to any number of things. You can give your life to any number of things. The only thing worthy is that which God loves. And Christ loves his church. And it brings us naturally to our third command, which is let no man glory in men. We see this right in verse 21 through the end of the chapter. Therefore, let no man glory in men. And therefore reminds us to look back it's interesting he says look a judgment day is coming and those people that invested heavily in god's people be rewarded those who invested with a tight fist into god's people they'll suffer reward those people who sought to destroy the work of god they'll be destroyed therefore so that i'm having trouble connecting those dots Therefore, let no man glory in men. But I think what he's trying to say is, your life is much more than the pettiness that you're making it about. You're going to stand before God one day. And here they were as a church, fighting and bickering over something that is petty. It was petty. Paul's saying, put that away. Invest in that which is most important. Put your best investment Where God's working. Don't glory in men. Don't put your boast in men. They chose to make their lives about this. When God had called them to make their lives about this. 
The word glory means to boast in or to brag about or to rejoice in. And some of the men of the church were divided over who had led them to faith or who had helped them to grow. I'm of Paul, said one. I'm of Apollos, said another. And Paul is saying that's a small thing to make your boast in. Think about it, church. You have God. You have Christ. And Paul's saying, and you would be divided over me? Think of that. You have God. You have Christ. He's yours. And you would be divided over Apollos, Cephas, some small little thing. It's a petty thing to make your boast in. Our dear Lord Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 23, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. And Paul's saying, in effect, the same thing here. Your life is more than what you've chosen to make your life about. You've chosen to make your life about this small thing. The Christian life is more. The Christian life is so much more. The Christian life is so much that Paul says, all things are yours. You are a possessor of all things in Christ. Paul was a gift from God to you. What else does he say? Apollos. Apollos is a gift from God to you. Peter, Cephas, he was a gift from God to you. All the things in the world, the things we thank God for this morning, clean air, clean water, food, drink, all these things, they're yours. All the circumstances in life that have brought you to this moment right now, in the present, they're a gift from God to you. And everything that's coming to you in the future it's God's gift to you. All things are yours, and you are Christ's. All things are yours. Consider this. You're the possessor of all good things. And Christ is the possessor of you. And God is the possessor of Christ. When you think of what has been given freely to you, consider that you were freely given to Christ. Put under His care, under His watch, held by His power. Think on that. I think Paul's trying to make all the things of the world, as the song says, grow strangely dim. To make us say, why are we fighting over this petty thing when so much belongs to us. Would you find Genesis 13 in your Bibles? All things are yours. And the church is fighting like little children who are failing to get along with each other over a little toy in a nursery filled with toys and they fight over one little block. And Paul says, how petty, how small, how silly. In Genesis 12... God had come to Abram, said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. He'd given him his gracious promise. And Abram left his home to go and seek a city that, whose builder and maker was God. He was going to find what God could offer, what God could give to him. And some of his family had tagged along, and as family does, sometimes trouble arises. Genesis 13, we find that Abram was a really wealthy man with lots of flocks and herdsmen, and his nephew Lot, who was with him, was, was also blessed by God with plenty of herds and workers. And some of the fields were getting crowded, and there was some strife among the herdsmen. And look in verse 8 of Genesis 13. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And notice the phrase in verse 9, the whole land. The whole land. 
Abram is looking out over the whole land as a possessor of the whole land, what does it matter what Lot has? What does it matter what Lot gets? And you hear the generous tone of Abram's voice, and we could ask, how could he be so generous? Well, maybe he's just a naturally generous person. Maybe he was born with the milk of human kindness running through his veins. I doubt that's the case. I think what it is is that he had received the promise of God. He was going to be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And he says, the whole land is before us. Take whatever you want. And if you remember the story, Lot looked and he says, here's the well watered. Here's the best part. I'll take the best part. And Abram could generously let the best part go to someone else. Why? Because the whole thing was his. It was all his. It had been given to him. You remember the promise. Look at, flip back. Look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. God had given him so much in a promise, and he believed the promise. So what is the loss of a well-watered plain when compared to a worldwide blessing from God? How do you compare the two? And as soon as, as, soon as Abram operates generously on faith, go back to Genesis 13, we see God operating on his behalf. As soon as he acts generously in faith, look at Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward for all the land which thou seest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it for I will give it unto thee. And Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Abraham understood the, the size of his inheritance. Northward, southward, eastward, westward. He understood the immensity of his inheritance. And everything else became little. And that's what Paul is trying to help the church to do. Church, can you recognize what you have in Christ? The forgiveness of sins. Have you ever fallen down into the deep, dark depths of your own soul? Have you ever free fallen as deep as you can into the blackness, the, the pit of your own soul? Have you seen the depth of your depravity? Have you recognized how many vows you've broken? How often you've been unfaithful in your heart to promises you've made? How often you've hurt and cursed and despised other people in your own heart? Have you ever recognized how filthy, how vile, how depraved, how far from God you are? And as you fell down that dark, deep pit, have you ever recognized the blood of Christ covers even this? And for every level of depth you pass, you don't find yourself despairing. You find yourself worshiping. You find yourself praising God, saying the blood of Christ cleanses even this. The blood of Christ covers even this. The immensity of my sin, the depth of my sin, I could not plumb it. I could not reach the bottom of it. But the blood of Christ covers all of it. Have you ever found yourself there? Have you ever recognized the immensity of what you possess in Christ? Have you considered what eternity is like? Have you considered what it will be like to be free from sin, to be free from pain, to be free from heartache? 
Have you considered what you have in Christ? And Paul's saying, don't be caught up in the pettiness of the world. Compared to eternity, compared to eternity, a lifetime of suffering is small. Compared to eternity, a lifetime of pain and sin is small. Can you recognize what Christ has given to you? What you possess in Christ? A friend of mine was talking to me last night about a problem in uh, a church near us. And and a couple's going through a divorce and they're mistreating each other and it's heartbreaking. And I thought, when, when did we get the idea that we own ourselves? And I realized it was when we forgot that we were bought with a price. Bought with a price. You were purchased. You are possessed. You are owned You've received the promise of the new covenant. You own the blessings of the new covenant. All these things are yours. Christ is God's and you, church, are Christ's. And He is working all things together for your good. Let him that boasts, boast in the Lord. Let none of us glory in in men. So where is your boast today? And yours may not be like Corinth. You may not boast in men, but you may boast in something other than Christ. That's entirely possible, isn't it? To glory in something other than Christ. Don't let the world define what's important. Don't let the world define that which is worthy of your investment. Don't let the world dictate what is or what is not acceptable behavior in the church of Christ. And don't let the world decide what you'll boast in. We have the mind of Christ. Church, you are the building of God. God is working here. Put on biblical glasses. Let God show you what is important. And let us make our boast in Christ. Would you bow with me in prayer? We've come to the end of chapter 3 and we've seen that the church is God's building. Ye are God's building. You are God's temple. I believe Christ is here with us now. And I'm sure He's working in hearts. Maybe there's someone here and you're not saved. You're not a Christian. Paul said that he laid waste to the church of God, but he received mercy because he did it ignorantly and in unbelief. Friend, are you ready to turn from your unbelief? Turn to Christ and be saved? Have you ever fallen down that pit of your own soul, seen the depth of your sin? And proclaim to yourself by God's grace the blood of Jesus cleanses. Even this, even this is washed away. It's gone in the sea of God's forgetfulness. If you have not had that experience, won't you turn to Christ? Call out to Christ. Trust in Christ. He will save you, as we sang this morning. He will save you. He'll save you. He'll save you. And I'll talk to those who are believers here this morning. Is your boast in Christ? Is your boast in Christ? What do you glory in? Let no man glory in men. All things are yours. 
glory in Christ and in what he's done. Maybe you'd say, I need to spend more time meditating on what he's done for me. And I can understand that. Let's grow in this, church. Let's grow in this. Father, I pray you'd help us now as we seek you, as we seek your face. Help every person here, wherever we are in our Christian life, wherever we are in our walk with you, help us now. Help us by your Spirit. Those who are just learning to walk by faith, help them. Those who are seasoned and who say, yet I need to grow still. God, would you help us? Help each of us. We need you. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. Jane, why don't you play a verse of something in church? Let's seek the Lord together. Amen and amen. Would you grab your bulletins real quick? I'm going to go through a couple of announcements. You'll notice on the inside right away, I've given a little thank you to everyone for last week, and I want to say it again. Every person who participated really made it special. I enjoyed all of it. I enjoyed the fellowship and and just the way the, the Lord uses our church to come together and be a blessing. I'm thankful for that. It is a tremendous blessing. Continue to pray for Elijah. He's gone to West Virginia this week. He's preaching at uh, his former church all day. So just pray that the Lord will use him and bless him there. And then look at the events coming up on the right-hand side. We are doing Set Up and Serve at the Haven of Rest tomorrow. And uh, if you're able to go, you ought to. If you have the, the health and the strength, the ability, that is really a good time. If you have questions about it, you can ask me. But it's a great opportunity to serve people and uh, to serve the Lord by serving the weakest among us. And uh, it's a good ministry. It's a good, good opportunity to participate. And then uh, our afternoon service is next Sunday at 2. So if you have some young people who might want to come and enjoy that, we, I think we've been doing like 12 and under, but most of them are 10 and under who come. But uh, if you have some young people who'd like to come, it's a good opportunity. You can enjoy the service, and they can enjoy some age-appropriate teaching And then notice that both Mojica families are going to be with us, one in September and one in October. On the 18th, Matias and Mary, I I think it's Matias is how they say it, or Matias, I'm going to say it wrong, but I think it's Matias. But um, this is the senior and his wife, and then in October, the junior and his wife and their little baby are going to be with us. So, So that's going to be a good time. So be in your place for those You'll be blessed by them. He's going to do uh, this on September 18th. He's going to give us an update in the morning about how the work is going in Sunday school, and then he'll be preaching for us in the AM service, and that'll be really good. Lastly, do not forget the uh, meeting coming up on the 15th, the Young at Heart meeting. There are some flyers on the back. Make sure that you grab it on your way out if you're able to be at this. It's always a good time. Brother Josh does a good job of putting those things together. I think he might need a couple of people to sign up for some food, and uh, he'll probably be talking to you about that uh, in, the, in the future. So that'll be good. But it's going to be a good time. Brother Gillen is going to do a great job. He always does. He'll be a blessing to you. It'll be the first one that I miss, and that's because I'm under 50 now. No, I'm just kidding. It'll be because I'm out of town, so you can be praying for us on our trip. Oh, I said that was the last, but one more thing. Grab one of these on your way out and stick it on your fridge. Make sure it's on your calendar. We have five meetings, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Five meetings with Brother Van Gelderen, and he's going to be a blessing to us. I know it. So you be in prayer for that. Put it on your calendar. Let's try to have every member at every meeting, and if you want to bring a guest, that would be wonderful. I know they'll be blessed by it. Um, He is a 
good speaker. Um, and, and by that, I mean two different things. One, he's not going to do things that would embarrass us, and I appreciate that. And secondly, he's going to speak the word of God plainly and with power. And so I'm thankful for that. So let's stand together. We'll be dismissed. You bring some people to this. If you want to grab a couple of extra and poke them up around town on a billboard or bulletin board, that would be fine too. We'd love to have folks come, but we want you there for sure. Everyone there. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you again for your goodness towards us. We pray that you'd bless us now as we go, that you would oversee our our steps away from this place. We want to go in the power of the Spirit, walking by faith, and we pray that you'd help us. And we ask for these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us, died for us, and lives in and with us now by his Spirit. Amen. God bless you, my friends. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful afternoon, wonderful Lord's Day.